So it's one of those things that makes it. In, in all seriousness, <laughs> like the a bill we're interested in, we wanted to hear directly from the sponsor. So, um, Senator Lyons. So thank you for the record, uh, Senator Jenny Lyons from Chittenden County. And uh, I always forget the number of this bill. So you'll have to help. 323. 323, thank you. Um, it's really a, it's a, it's a straightforward request to provide um, uh, hygiene, sanitary hygiene products to uh, young women in uh, public school bathrooms. It, it says high school bathrooms, mm -hmm. uh, but I, I think it probably should be considered for both high school and middle school at least, given that menstrual cycles are beginning earlier or earlier in, uh, in girls' uh, lives. And, knowing that um, these products are not inexpensive, A. B, um, kids just don't know when they're gonna need them, so they don't always carry them around with them, and um, so few kids carry quarters or nickels or whatever now you have put in machines. I don't know if they carry credit cards. So having access to um, these products, I think would be, it, it, it's a great asset. Uh, for, for girls. Um, and thinking about some of the other things that we offer at no cost in schools, including contraception, um, this one for me rises above that. Sorry, but um, I just think it's really important. There are a lot of, uh, there, there are a lot of concerns I think that one could express about not having us available. And having it in um, in bathrooms makes a lot of sense. Uh, it's difficult, I think, for a young girl to go in and ask for something like this. If they would have to go yeah, down sure. in the nurse's office or from a teacher, uh, it's bad enough. Uh, probably, I don't know what kids are like today, but I've always been pretty darn shy about saying anything. And, uh, so I, th I just think it's a, something that I'm glad you're considering it. And I, I hope you'll take some testimony and think about doing it. Of course. Senator Ingram. <laughs> the whole committee is here. <laughs> slowly, slowly. Rarely have. <laughs> I also do. Do, uh, do you have any idea what the cost would be? I have no idea what the cost would be. You know, there's no fiscal note with it. You'd have to, it probably would be borne by each school. <coughs> Um, so it's another issue, but in the there may also be um, alternatives to paying for it. And some of the some food banks, for example, offer this type of product, and it might be that there are volunteer organizations that would help fund this or raise money or do it collaboratively with the with the school budget. I think, um, but I I think. I don't think it could be that expensive. <laughs> I guess um, the one thing I would say is if we make the determination that they should be provided free of charge, that it's, that yeah. it's an essential, then I would be hesitant to put it on um, you know, private philanthropy or something. Mm -hmm. um, we don't do that with toilet paper. We don't say, go see no. if someone's willing to give you toilet paper. <laughs> well, it, um, it should be in the school district. There's no question about it. But a school district can also use its creativity to yeah. find money for other things. But I think, I, I agree with you, this is an essential. It's not something yeah. you can uh, say is ancillary to life. I, I did have a discussion of this with my daughter last night um, because she had complained randomly about a very similar issue um, a couple of weeks ago. And so I told her about this bill. And she said that in Burlington High School, she goes now. There is one bathroom that has one machine that has never been stocked since she has been there. So it's a machine you pay for, and no one can pay for it because it's never filled. So I like the wording here where it says, um, shall make available, uh, because it's not that we're saying they have to install a machine and then never fill it. They, they have to make sure that there's access to the public. Um, so I imagine two 
practical considerations that I, that I do want to take testimony from the educational community about. One would be cost, obviously, and then the other would be, I would imagine, some, we've, we've had a discussion of this at least once in this committee in the past, and the other consideration was vandalism, that these products would be used somehow to stop up plumbing, or they'd be abused in some way, but again, the same can be said about toilet paper. It right. can be used to vandalize a bathroom. Or the same could be said about products that are not given out for free. So exactly. Like that, so. yeah. but, uh, but those are two areas where we'll, we'll ask um, you know, some on the Sure. Ground. Yeah, there, there, are, there are a number of issues that um, yeah. come out. And I, and I should point out, this is almost kind of a companion bill to one that's, I believe, on the Finance Committee now, which yeah. is to remove the tax. Right. From these products, yeah. yeah. So um, I, I think it's make it cheaper. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's part of the <laughs> yeah. Great. Thank you. So okay. Any other questions for Senator Lyons? I, I just want to comment that a lot of schools already do provide it, so I don't. The fiscal effect may not be as high as you think. Because there may be think? some districts that already are are paying for these things and just maybe not putting them in the bathroom, but still already paying. Right. I think one of the questions you have to ask is, if you don't have it in the bathroom, right. are the kids willing to go and ask for this? Right. right. I agree. I agree. I mean, it's I think like, it should oh. be in the bathroom. Yeah. But I guess my point was that they may already be yeah. on the budget. Yeah. Good. Thanks. Okay. Thank you, Senator Lyon. Hello. Okay. Hello. Katie McLean, the Legislative Council. So as um, Senator Lyon said, the language in this bill is fairly straightforward and fairly short. So almost famous last words by saying it that way. Um, but it creates a new section in Title 16. It directs that a school district shall make menstrual hygiene products available at no cost in all gender neutral bathrooms and bathrooms designated for females located in public high schools. Then we have a definition of menstrual hygiene products to include sanitary napkins and tampons. And in subsection B, this is where we address um, the payment. School districts are to bear the cost of supplying these products and the school district may seek grants or partner with a nonprofit or community-based organization to fulfill the obligation. In terms of effective of date, the bill itself would take effect on passage, but it wouldn't be, uh, school districts wouldn't have to comply with it until the 2021-2022 academic year. Yeah. Um, hi there, nice to see you in this committee. Yeah. <laughs> I see Katie all the time in my morning. Um, on uh, the first page on um, line 18, um, it says uh, they can seek grants and partner with a nonprofit. But could a school, um, like a, a for profit com company, to, to donate? The, uh, is there a reason why that would be precluded? Um, Not to my knowledge. Um, we could change the language to include for profit companies or to get a grant. Yep. Yeah. Uh -huh. yeah. So you mean like seventh generation? Maybe? Yeah, like somebody would. Um, yeah, or or tampon company would want to you know, I don't know. So that gets into. A yeah, slip. it does get into. Yeah. To, yeah uh -huh. But we can yeah, we can talk about that. that but, yeah. Maybe the football team could have like the logo of the. Top. Yeah. Um, so I, I just had a quick question. Uh, so. As it stands, it says they shall make them uh, available at no cost. Mm -hmm. um, there's no penalty or enforcement mechanism, or is there a default? That I'm not sure about Title 16. So you're right, there's no specific penalty in this section, mm -hmm. but I'd have to look at Title 16 more carefully to see if there's a general default for all yeah. sections that aren't complied with. Yeah, I'm, I'm just thinking that um, there are certain issues more than others that tend to be kind of um, subject to silent, silent protest, like we're, we're just not going to do it um, and wait, we'll wait till somebody complains. And those tend to usually group around the right set filing and the dominant groups. So I could see this potentially being something that, say, a school board somewhere might want decide not to act on. Um, so I'm just just wondering what kind of levers there are to enforce it. Sure, I'm happy to look into that for okay. you. Just not 
familiar. 16. In that, that line 18, where do you, is that in there because there's somewhere else in Title 16? Because I'm not familiar with it, where it says that mm -hmm. districts can't seek grants or partner with nonprofit community based organizations to fulfill other obligations of the school or purchase other things? Um, not that I'm aware of, um, but I think this language is to clarify that it doesn't just have to come out of the school district's bottom line, that they could seek other type of contributions and we can talk about the in kind contributions. I just wonder if they could do it for anything else. Yeah. I assume they yeah. could. Yeah. You do, like a lot of sports do. Right. Yeah. You know, take it like Pepsi buys a scoreboard, but it says Pepsi. Yeah, well, that's scoreboard. what I was thinking of. But I think he, but you're talking about a non profit. Doing well, I'm just wondering if this was in here because somewhere else it says you can't, because I thought well, there, the schools are accepting. Reasons. There are, there are certain, the way that finance formula works is that there are certain things that are outside of the school budget. So if they are paid for by grant money, but there are right. also like part of that, I think it was Act 60, that, right. that makes limitations on what school so districts not, can pay for no. by fundraising because yeah. you don't want the wealthy towns to be able to. Mm -hmm. um, so I think this warrants a little further discussion on whether this is necessary or if we want to start this precedent. I, right. I think it's easier to eliminate it. Yeah. So. yeah, I wondered about it. It's not like that. Yeah, because it's probably not going to be a lot of money. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you very much, Kate. Appreciate yeah. it. No. So, okay. Mr. Remmers, uh, um, good to meet you. Um, so we are in the in the process of looking at a bill that would realign duties between the state board and AOE and potentially the month standard board. Um, and so we wondered, first of all, had you had a chance to look at that language? And then, um, yes, I, I did read through it. Um, you know, I, I actually. Um, you know, I, I only saw the, the standards board reference in a few sections, so I was kind of curious as to where you guys were seeing the We shifts. wanted to, um, I think, uh, Jimmy, do you have another copy of this? So we, um, we had our legislative council prepared this list of um, who has authority over which rules. Mm -hmm. um, here's an extra copy. Oh. Um, and so I think it was. The 5,000. Yeah, 5,000. We, we had a question as it, as it um, stands now and as it would be here, what your thoughts were on the 5000 series. Um, it's now going to be in the statute that State Board of Education would be making those rules. It is? Uh, well, so. That's, that's the, the bill as it is currently drafted. OK. So. That's current law. Yes. Right. No, it's not actually. Well, so what no, thing, that's the one that was moved. Yeah, so the, the issue that our our legislative council, who's just walking in right now, we're talking about the 5,000 series rules, um, is that it is under the State Board of Education, but all of the references to who is responsible for the rules are the license, it is your operation. Correct. And so there's a disconnect between what is in statute, and I would defer to the council, but that was what we were trying to clear up. Yeah, so the, the authorities are, uh, for the record, Jim Gamer, as council, for the record, uh, but the um, uh, statutes say that the Sam's Board has authority to make rules, mm -hmm. uh, but the rules are actually under the State Board of Education, mm -hmm. so we're just wondering why that, why that is. Okay, so, so we were looking for clarity and your point of view. Um, I, I guess I, I would need to work down towards a few more details. I mean, are, we, are we asking um, whether or not um, the, the State Board of Education could assume the responsibilities of the work of the Vermont Standards Board? I don't think I don't think that's the intent. Okay. Um, you know, I, I did I did see in parts where um, it was the responsibility, uh, it was the duty of the um, Secretary of Education to bring. Um, our work to, this, to the uh, State Board of Education for approval. So let me, um, 
let me begin something that we have hoped to do today, okay. which was the, the whole point of today was to have uh, you, uh, John Carroll, and Secretary French in the room sure. so that we could have a little bit of real-time discussion. Sure. So um, at this point, could I, John, could I just ask you, maybe you can clarify, um, since you were instrumental in the drafting, what, what your intention was. Well, the only, the intent with the rules generally was to leave the broad policy, all of, let me back up, this entire list of rules, top and bottom, are, are currently um, listed as board, uh, board rules. The board has the authority to adopt, <coughs> currently under the present law, all of these rules, including 5,000. Yeah. Um, the general purpose of the bill is to uh, shift to the agency uh, the majority of these rules, actually, the authority to adopt these rules without reference to the state board. Uh, the ones at the top would stay as they are now with the, with the state board, and the ones at the bottom would be, uh, come, would be, uh, be under the authority of the agency of education and not the state board. Okay. The issue, though, today is that the state board doesn't have authority to issue rules. The 5,000 series is not under the state board's jurisdiction. It's in the bill under your jurisdiction, correction, correction, and that's not the way it works today. It's under your jurisdiction. So I'm not sure why they're actually adopted by the state board, and they're actually, the authority to promulgate is with the external board. Okay. That's my question. That's what I'm trying to figure out. Um, I don't think there's an intent to move it to the state board, but the way it lays out today doesn't quite make sense to me. No, no, I, I, I'm beginning to understand here, and, yeah. and I, I, I don't know that I can clarify why it's necessarily that way or how it was built, um, you know, but I would certainly, you know, uh, recommend that it remain with the, with the standards board as much as possible, as I, I think the work of the state board is charged enough. Yeah, indeed. Yeah. So, um, in that case, do you, do you support the way this would be laid out now in the statute? So, as in statute, as I'm reading it here, is that um, we are essentially making recommendations for rule revision, and that would then be presented to um, the Secretary of Education, who then presents it to the, the State Board. Is that correct? Jim, is that the, the way it works in the What we're putting up now in this bill is that the, the responsibility will be transferred from you to the State Board, which uh, you want. Uh, uh, I, I, when I, you, when, when uh, Chair Carroll, get, get, when you went through the list of rules, yeah. uh, which I took from you and put in the bill, I had to realize that at that point that one of those rules actually you didn't have authority to, to promulgate. Okay. Uh, that's how I got in here. Yeah. Yeah. I just took this list of rules from the agency's website, yeah. the state board website. Okay. So it, it would say that it would suggest the state board's website is an error in this regard. I'm, I'm, not, sure, I'm not sure about that. Yeah. But what I think we are concluding maybe is that it should not be transferred to the state board, Fair enough. which we can fix in the draft. Yeah. And I support that. I yeah. think it should remain yeah. in the title of the Vermont Standards Board. Yeah. OK. Uh, and Secretary French, anything to add on that? No, just to uh, talk about the larger issue of how we're certainly supportive of trying to separate these things out and clean it up. I think, you know, the result of Act 98 is this, I think it's overdue that this occur. Yeah. Uh, but the devil's in some of the details, and um, I was, one of the things I wanted to convey today is I think there needs to be a better sort of logic adopted in how this happens, mm -hmm. as opposed to just sort of picking and choosing which, mm -hmm. which things go to which pile. This is an example of, you know, something the devil's in the details, so to speak, and have to be very clear about what I think what our policy intention is um, to ensure that can be done in a seamless way. The issue of putting stuff on websites, the consumers of the rules don't need to understand sort of that bifurcation process. They need to have a uniform sense of where the rules are and what they are, and they should not have to go to three different websites or mm -hmm. to multiple rules, in my humble opinion, go to multiple rules and emails to understand if they had agreements or a concern about the rule. Oh, do you go to the state board, do you go to the secretary, do you go to the state, mm -hmm. you know, so as much as possible, that's sort of the website set up that way all the rules are in one place. Yeah. But I, I'd be happy to weigh in further. I mean, absolutely. Yeah. I just wanted to deal with this one first yeah. because it's an outlier. It was, um, we thought it was a mistake, um, and it seems that that's what it is. 
it seems like what what we're arguing for is to leave that status quo. Um, and Jim, you're clear on that. Uh -huh. Okay. Great. Okay. Right. I think your work here is done. <laughs> <laughs> Glad I can be a service. Okay, Secretary French, why don't I ask you to begin? Okay. Um, you said to paraphrase you, you said that there should be an overriding logic rather than a pick and choose um, in terms of which rulemaking authority we move. I think, and, and correct me if I'm wrong, John, but I think uh, in large part it was dictated by current practice. Um, uh, so nominally, the state board retained power, but the secretary had already been doing some of this. And so we're the agency does the vast amount of the work yeah. in preparing the rules, and then they are kind of blessed by the board. The board sometimes has contributions to make. And I think, for me, the decision rule was, uh, is the topic of the rule, or, or 35 of them, is the topic of the rule essentially administrative, yeah. about which the board brings no expertise? I mean, the obvious one being, how long should school buses be allowed to idle? Um, the board brings no uh, insight or expertise to that, and it seemed like, well, maybe maybe this, the agency knows a lot about that. Uh, so those kind of things we suggested should be placed squarely in the agency, not only to develop the rules, as they always do, but also to adopt them. OK. So, um, I've just passed down a copy of the chart that Jim Demaray prepared. And what it, what it does is it takes the entire list of things that the state board was charged with in statute, and it, it indicates which ones in our draft are to be moved formally to AOE. So my, my opening question for the secretary would be, um, have you have you had a chance to think about um, how this sits with you, not just philosophically, but in that fine grain to detail? Yeah, I mean, that, uh, to your point, has provoked sort of a, uh, I don't say use the word philosophy, but it's provoked a sort of a question of the logic employed. So that's all I brought with me today, was just sort of a quick summary of how we would suggest a logic, a logic model that could be introduced to, uh, to help sort this out a little bit. I think the, uh, the issue for us is really in those last two bullets. I think um, you know one of the <coughs> there's two criteria I think we we should um, use as we go about this important process. One is this idea of policy coherence that there should be a direct relationship between statutory authority, regulation, and then technical guidance. So technical guidance being a more granular thing that we put out, whether it be a spreadsheet or in some aspect basically done on the secretary's authority and regulation being an intermediate group. But there should be a through line between those things. And unfortunately, we've had uh, examples in the last you know, 10 years or so, but that's not necessarily the case. Partially, uh, with the transition, I think, under Act 98, where essentially the state board had uh, almost uh, authority to regulate the education system independent of statutory authority. So I think, you know, we're, you know, when I say follow the need for policy coherence, I think that's driven our assessment that's driven by an understanding of the context, the historical moment we're in as an education system with the demographic challenges and what appears to be a growing inequity of opportunity, both academically and in issues like school facilities and so forth. So there's there's a need to have a type, better tightly integrated uh, regulatory framework. Um, and that second piece of it, as a result of that, would yield better accountability, which is a challenge we often find ourselves in as an agency bigger source of frustration for us is that who, who are we accountable to? Um, under Act 98, I think it's anticipated that the secretary, the secretary does report to the governor, uh, but it's hard to um, hard to enact the General Assembly's requirements when we don't are not responsible necessarily for our own rulemaking authority. Mm -hmm. Even though I think under the transition uh, with Act 98, the agency, uh, as the Department of Education previously had essentially its own rulemaking authority, <coughs> the agency to the agency, so it can write now its own rulemaking authority. Um, so I think this issue of accountability is increasingly an important concept because particularly we're dealing with the policies in front of us now, I use Act 173 as an example, are really policies that are very complex but also integrated across uh, state uh, agency boundaries. So there's a lot of interplay with mental health, for example. 
so we need we need to have clear lines of delineation and responsibility. Um, so when I when I apply those two filters to this list, what I would suggest is that all regulation should exist under the agency's authority. There's a role for the state board, I think, to act as a mechanism of accountability, perhaps, where before anything is pursued by the agency, the state board sort of green lights it. Uh, but as the chair said, most of the legwork done on regulation is done by the agency from its technical orientation. And also to point out that we also have a responsibility uh, under federal law as the SEA. Uh, many, many uh, of the programs specifically that we administer are attached to federal requirements and so forth. So we are ultimately held with very clear accountability in that regard. Um, and we need to have the authority to promulgate rules that uh, allow us to fulfill that responsibility. So my analysis, if I subject those two criteria to this process, what it would result in is uh, all rules, and I, I would make the exception of the standards board, I think it's important they retain responsibility over those rules. Mm -hmm. But there's some issues there I think that we should be attended to, but that could be done with statute, and I'm happy to expand on that. Basically a pipeline development, I think the teacher shortage issues and stuff that could be addressed better through statute. statute. But the, uh, the framework, all the rules should more or less fall, should all fall under the agency's uh, promulgated authority, and then I would interject some mechanism for the state board to sort of green light that process before rules are advanced. But the so process we have now is, is too cumbersome and it sort of uh, undermines accountability. So would the idea be to have the state board not promulgate any rules? Absent the agency initiative. So the agency, for instance, in the case of 173, would produce a draft yeah, kind of what's right now. Before we would go forward and formal our process of rulemaking, the agency or the board would have a, you know, a time certain period to green light it or not, mm -hmm. um, as opposed to them being sort of the owner of the rules. And I, you know, I just brought up an example. I mean, 173 is an interesting context. This is, or these are federal special ed laws and regulations. Yeah. You know, these are the current state regulations. Um, to take a, a essentially a lay board and through a, a very complex process is, is a challenging dynamic in which we're going to have to enact really critical civil rights issues and federal funding responsibilities. So we haven't put any energy onto coming up with some specific language to do that because I think you know the framing of this is where if we had a conceptual agreement of applying some logic, we'd be happy to throw some horsepower behind that. Um, but absent that, I think I would just I would just suggest sort of a division of things. Uh, I mean, I'm not sure what the logic was to do this per se, other than what I heard the board sort of expressing an affinity for certain topics versus others. I don't know if I would adopt this if there's logic model to do this separately. Mm -hmm. Well, I, I think affinity is one way to put it. I think institutional memory is another. Um, in other words, certain rule series the, the state board has um, Created an architecture over the years, um, so I can I can see uh, a willingness on their part to continue that. So, if I could just go rewind just a little bit, it seemed as though you said you would you would prefer that there be an overriding logic, and you believe that the, the most compelling one would be to have all rulemaking authority at the agency. <laughs> Did I hear you right then to say if we weren't going to do that? then you viewed it more as a, 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 a duty split or a sharing of responsibility? Yeah, I didn't, I, that would be, we haven't put any effort on really analyzing this, you know, we, like kind of where we started today, looking at the standards board down to that granular, we could certainly yeah. engage on an item by item basis, uh, but I think where our initial reaction was, because we do want to support the board for, to its uh, effort on this has been really, really positive, and we want to support them in the work. But I, what struck us in this sort of division was sort of a lack of an overarching logic. And I think the, um, the idea of policy coherence, and particularly when I think of the recent case of X77 and uh, proficiency-based learning, yeah, yeah. you know, as we discovered sort of mutually that there is no sort of statutory authority for proficiency-based learning, um, it's, I think it's increasingly going to be challenging for us to enact good policy if we don't have a better connection between statutory authority and regulation. It's hard for me to imagine a situation where the agency would be promulgating rules with absent statutory authority. You know, that we, we would largely, as a part of the executive branch, be reacting to policy that was established by the statute. Mm -hmm. Well, and, and as, as um, John Carroll knows, I, I believe that the state board has, um, in the recent past, taken on uh, jobs that weren't laid out for it. 
promulgated rules that no one was really asking for, absent some interior motivation within the board. With that said, um, what I have found very useful about this draft is that it seems to me the state board was um, willingly narrowing its own portfolio um, and increasing the, 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 the duty split when, when we made AOE an agency. And um, there were, I, I was in the committee and I opposed that bill actually, but there were, <laughs> there were promises made around the table about the state board retaining uh, an independent role and then the agency acquiring a, a larger role, but also being accountable, as you said, indirectly to the voters via the governor. Um, so <coughs> I viewed this draft as helpful because it seemed to me to begin a process of envisioning a narrower role for the board, but a continuing role for the board in rulemaking. If, if that is the direction that we continue to move in, we would be asking them for AOE to, to get into the weeds with each of these remaining pieces, rulemaking pieces, that this draft leaves with the board. I assume there would be some where there would be a stronger argument on your part than others. Um, am, am I reading you right that, that that's not where you want to go today? Is Yeah, that's correct. I mean, we um, we certainly could embark on that journey. I think, you know, to the, where we, you know, the chair and I were corresponding your email, we have general agreement that there's a good separation here between policy versus administration. Mm -hmm. um, what I would say, I have a hard time applying that logic to the administration of some things and the administration of not other things. And I see mm -hmm. the ability of the board retaining policy authority over uh, regulatory authority over its items as being inconsistent with its role in, in advancing a larger, higher level policy. Mm -hmm. So to me, they're inconsistent. And also, uh, I think, once again, the, the agency, I mean, to use the point of uh, the 2200 series, sorry, yep. the agency can get blocked on rulemaking authority, too. You sure. know, so it's not, I don't think, you know, just the point of the, the board's excursion that the agency as a regulatory body has its own inertia on that. You know. And that's why it's important, and, and I included the statement of our, our purpose work, that we we, you know, part of the work we've come together is to say, look, you know, we're not going to go on those excursions. We're going to really, I mean, as, as a basis of achieving equity and, and high quality for all Vermont students, our authority needs to be well grounded in statutory authority. And we're, we're not going to go off and do projects or things that we haven't been explicitly, you know, told to do. We have a leadership role, which is at the front end of the process to come in and advocate for things we might see in the data and so forth. But once the statute's been established, our, our role is to enact that. So we see, you know, the need, the need for that discipline would be helpful at this moment in time for the state uh, because it's been lacking. I, I agree. And the, the final thing I would say is that um, I think that's everybody's intention with, with this draft from the people who wrote it to the committee that's been looking at it. Um, I guess it would be helpful ultimately for us to know of the <laughs> 15 or so areas that the state board under this draft retains rulemaking authority. Um, if if we if we so your your agency has been somewhat strapped, has been uh, had had a very full plate, and I think if we take Act 46 for instance, I think the board did yeoman's work helping out uh, at, even as a lay board. Um, so what chunks of this 15 areas yeah. could you see remaining with the board and could you be um, comfortable with? And then I think that gives us an area of agreement and then we can discuss the places where you disagree and come to yeah. our own conclusions. Yeah, no, I, I think, you know, to use the case of Act 46 as an example, I think it was, a, it was the Yeoman's work on the part of the board some of the best board work I've ever seen. The contribution they made, though, wasn't necessarily technical, it was political. And, you know, we, we had to do the technical work that certainly informed their political debate, and there's certainly a crosswalk going back and forth, but we're not equipped to do that political work. That was essential to formulate the statewide plan. But we were, you know, in situated to do the technical support of their deliberations. Yeah. So, I mean, that's, 
that's a specific problem that requires additional political, political interaction, which I think justifies the existence of a state board-like entity. Mm -hmm. uh, we're, you know, as we envision our role, that's not appropriate for us to engage. On the other hand, you know, in terms of capacity, to to spend time having to, to educate a lay board about highly technical, you know, special ed regulations, you know, it would free up our capacity not to have to do that. Yeah. And and maybe if I could ask, and and maybe this calls for a, a meeting between the two of you to to kind of finalize where you are on on this. But if I could ask you to situate your your thoughts and your agreement in three categories. One, where you believe AOE should have all authority. One, where you believe AOE should uh, initiate rules and then they go to the state board like the 173 rules. I think they played a good role there in terms of mediating a little between the advisory group and right. AOE. And then areas where you're comfortable with the board having rulemaking authority and basically developing the rules without a draft. Yeah. And we might apply, a, I would just suggest that sort of political versus technical paradigm, that rules that are more political in nature, some of these rules uh, are, are more of a political realm, shall we say, uh, and, and yeah. some are more technical. And then there are some that probably should be abolished. You know? yeah. So we have, I, I'm looking at you know, the board, of, I think it's uh, Jim 2400 that we're on the board. I mean, that rule speaks to the board creating a board if I'm not mistaken, you know, so there, there's things like that yeah. that we shouldn't be interested in carrying forward regardless of how we divide things up. Senator yeah. Furchin. Yeah, if we could get rid of some rules though, yeah. in the process, that would be a good thing. But when you talked about green lighting, is it, when you use that term, is that equal to like a veto authority? Yeah, or? I don't know, we have to explore that. Um, but as opposed to the board being responsible for engaging in the rulemaking process, we would we would bring that to conclusion and right. therefore owning the rules and the responsibility and accountability for enacting them. But I think as a measure, additional measure of accountability, which the board has served a very important role in that regard, they could sort of, I could anticipate that. Uh, and they introduced some language in the draft that speaks to the board sort of sitting in between that process and, and essentially being right. okay for something to go forward. Just, it provides the public yet another opportunity to be involved. Right, which I, I think I support. And it seems like even all the rules that the board is making now are really done, we talked about the architecture they've created, but they've created that within the agency because they don't have any staff, right? Yeah, I mean, there's, there's very few of these rules, if any, that don't require direct agency involvement in the creation of publication. Yeah, so, that's the other, so even the other on the board's so making the rules, you're making the rules. We are doing a lot of legwork, if not all of legwork. So we, we have to bring them to a place where they can begin to take it forward from a political perspective. Um, sometimes board members bring different levels of expertise, but like in the case of 173, the General Assembly created an advisory group precisely to bring additional right. type expertise to the yeah. process. The board, I don't think, was expected to bring specific technical expertise to that. They bring a political uh, convening authority. Um, but yeah, regardless of which rule it is, we're still going to be, you know, that's the point about the accountability right. piece. It's like whether the board does it or we do it, we're still doing it. So, right. so, yeah. so in terms of staffing and the, Unless they're given yeah. significant resources, which is, yeah. I don't know how, you right. know, you have to well, that was bad. That. Yeah. For the board is if, if you had, if you really have like a veto authority, <laughs> would you need to have any in your, in your kind of bucket? To, to promulgate if they if they have to come to you to get before they can submit them is that the same as having authority to promulgate them basically it, without it, having to do any of the work yeah it's it's they're pretty similar to the way it is now I think I'd want to understand better what green lighting means yeah. uh, because I think if there ought to be some red lighting as right. well uh, I think that's been proven by our work on Act 173 where we have um, asserted and uh, reminded folks that indeed it's the board that has to sign off on the final language of the rule, and that uh, I think frankly has gotten people's attention and that's been a useful process. Uh, so in that sense, we had a right red light right. authority. Uh, and it, it is certainly true that the, the legwork is done by the agency, and I think it's twas ever thus. Uh, uh, so, but, but the idea of the ability to initiate rules from the perspective of the board, which as you say is uh, more a community-based perspective and, and less an administrative perspective, 
uh, that seems to me to be need to be preserved. Um, it, even though, and it's a, it's a difficult case for me to make, because at the same time I readily acknowledge what the chair has said, is that the board has gone beyond its statutory authorities in some of these initiatives of its own. And uh, so uh, it's, uh, that's why you know, my takeaway on this is that if you do nothing else, please leave the language of the draft in front of you that, that says the board shall not initiate anything that is not explicitly provided by statute. And uh, you know, just to state maybe the obvious, the opening couple of pages of this bill situate everything very squarely under legislative intent. And I really appreciate that. That coupled with the spinning off of a majority of the rulemaking formally to the agency suggests to me very much the right direction. I think, you know, I, I don't myself envision getting rid of the board, and I haven't until uh, the secretary recommended it um, as one possibility. I haven't considered stripping them of all rulemaking. So I think what I had imagined was the re-envisioning of the duty split, but not removing their power to promulgate rules. That's a discussion we haven't had as a committee and haven't voted on yet. But um, I think the probably the path of least resistance is to um, have some subset of the, the top 15 here uh, that we ultimately agree on between agency and board. Um, I prefer that it not become, you know, uh, when, when we turned it into an agency and the commissioner into a secretary, there was a, there was a long fight around the table. It was a, a fight that went up into the governor's office and around to the house, and you know it was one of those turf battles that um, took most of the session, and ultimately um, it wound up in a compromise anyway. I'd rather just start in a compromise position, and I think you two are best situated to to make that happen and for us to then get behind <coughs> and agree on. So. I don't know what your timetable might might be, Secretary, for um, for helping to produce that. What would you like for a time? Uh, okay. You know, this is something I'd like to move out before crossover. I, I, it's a long, long bill. I'd rather not have it hanging around a long time. But could it be done by the end of next week? Yeah, we can try. I mean, it's you know, once again, it's uh, this this. Process. I appreciate your your interest in the sort of getting a compromise out of it. It reminds me a lot of 173, where we <laughs> we, have, we we don't necessarily follow a principle all the way through or a logic. Yeah. Where we seek compromise as the way. Mm -hmm. and that unfortunately, it doesn't get us right where we are now, which is uh, not coherence, which is our larger lens. To this. Um, I think the uh, you know the issues of. of from a stakeholder community perspective, to have stakeholders have, like, who do they go for, you know, to, for, you know, is it this rule, is the state board control that rule, is it the agency control that rule, you know, who, who's in charge, it's a problem. I think the efficiency issue of, of uh, needing to have resources to do the work on their own is, is interesting. Um, and there, there's essential items, I can tell you right now, that are in the top that we would want to have a rule And that's there. what we're looking for. I mean, really, the, the, this yeah. issue, fundamentally, of education quality standards. I mean, and this would be, the, I would just raise as a concern with the standards board, um, to not have regulatory authority over the, the essential quality elements of the system is problematic. And it, it's showing, it's a, the major contributor to our equity issue. And you'll hear me talk about, and I mentioned the other day when you were asking about capacity or additional capacity we might need, uh, you know, we've lost some regulatory authority over inputs in the system to guarantee baseline quality when we used to have school quality standards. And I think we need to reenact that kind of approach. So this issue over education quality standards is one I think is critical. In terms of the standards board, we're going to need to have more conversation with them around pipeline development stuff. So we we have an interest in um, talking about reciprocity in all mm -hmm. kinds of professions, and we we have a lot of barriers right now in our, in our licensing process where it's challenging sometimes for educators licensed in other states to come to mind. Um, and so I hear that continuously uh, from others. With so that said, yeah. this is exactly the sort of thing I was hoping to be able to do. Yeah. Then hear why. John thought education quality standards should remain with the board in terms of rulemaking. Um, well, that's that's 
the, the general characteristic of these are all about how education is deployed out into the states, into, into the state. I mean, we, we've discussed before that the nature of education here in our state and in many states is unlike any other executive function, uh, the uh, executive agency, and then the real work is done in school districts and superintendencies and in the classrooms. Um, and, and that's, that's uh, where 13,000 teachers are standing up and delivering. And that's where, uh, and, and so it seemed to us that having things like school district organization rules, which by the way are municipalities, uh, having their rules set by, the, by an executive branch agency uh, under the direct control of the governor didn't seem appropriate. I mean, there, there are some constitutional issues even about who can regulate municipalities and uh, understanding is it's you guys and nobody else. Uh, but I would disagree. I mean, I, yeah, just, okay. I would disagree with that's precisely the example. There, but if, if, if the, um, the case with 46 is reaffirming the Brigham decision, I mean, a central role of the Brigham decision is the logic that the state is ultimately responsible for education. And it delegates authority to those municipalities as it sees fits, but it can't delegate its responsibility. Mm -hmm. So on the essential issues of accountability, that's not delegated authority to municipalities. I mean, the state is ultimately responsible. So even on this list, school quality standards, students' performance and outcomes, yes, we delegate some responsibility to locals to do that with the expectation that they would enact the constitutional requirement to educate all their children. Mm -hmm. But they don't do that absent state responsibility for all students. So that's, I mean, that's the Brigham decision in, its, yeah. in a nutshell. And that's important. I'm thinking of this might be what the state board wants to do, but that is not the context constitutionally or legally by which we develop framework to the state for regulations. That's, it, that's an act. Uh, Senator Parent has hand up. Mine's a really question, but I think part of it too is, and I don't know if you've defined it as a committee, What's our vision for the State Board of Education? I think when we look at the rules, like what, what kind of work do we expect them to do? Mm -hmm. policy, you know, does it make sense necessarily for us to be like, school bus, bus idling goes here, but walking to school program goes here, you know, like what, you know, because I read some of these, some of these are talking, you know, we talk special ed finance, yeah, we have per pupil cost over here, so we have two different entities looking at cost structure. So I think we probably, to help them in their work, need to define as a committee what we see for the role of the state board. And, and, and me personally, I see a more limited one than they even asked for here. Because um, I think the way these rule out, you know, a big issue my way is proficiency-based grading. And under this, they still may have been able to make that kind of error. With, they and still we have could have too, and you know, so it's fair to so them. So it's but you know, mean, we have to, yeah. I think, you know, but you're easier for us to deal with because sort of it's an issue. So I sit here and you, you get in part time. Right. So. Um, <laughs> and um, so I think as a committee, we have to define what we see for a role of state board. And, and I'll be 100% honest, I don't see much of one. Mm -hmm. you know, we disagree on that, but I think that's, we have to decide before we give you the roles, I think we have to just kind of agree on a vision for, yep. for the board. Absolutely. Um, and, you know, to go back to the arguments about whether to have a, an agency or not, many people saw coherence and, and uh, accountability as the defining issue. And there were a lot of people who felt that what it would mean is you would get a more ideologically driven agency. Um, so one of the arguments that I would make and I, I include Act 46 here, as well as 173. Having, having a, a, you know, you've got the legislature here, you've got the, the agency here, and having the board out here with a defined role that the legislature picks and chooses has, in several instances, allowed us, I, I think, to get further than we would have um, faster. Um, and the, the secretary, I think, was exactly right when he talked about the board having a, a more uh, more capability politically out in the, the state, um, but but you know, looking at the end of Act 46, you had the, the secretary developing a map that then went to the state board, and they did another series of hearings around the state. Um, so I I see that role myself as one member of the committee. Corey's right that we'll we'll have a discussion about what what the board should be doing. Um, the secretary's begun the process of looking at this. Um, and 
Um, to, so if we're going to take out the authority from the board to do any new rule, that you, you expressly said you wanted to make sure we could fit in here, then it would just be these existing rules. But these existing rules are already all written, so it would only be amendments to these rules. Or the, and yes. would you, you ever envision making changes to rules absent legislative guidance to do so? Because in my world, of, in the state government I work on, we never, I can't imagine where we've enacted a new rule unless the legislature made a change. I would give you an illustration. Um, in um, Act 49, I think it is, you spell out um, changes in um, relationships between the independent schools and special education funding and uh, authority to receive special education funding. Mm -hmm. And you direct the general, the, sorry, you direct the board to modify the existing Rule 2200 to reflect the standards laid out in Act 49, Section 18, 1920, uh, which is work we need to start doing very soon. And in that particular case, uh, the language of the statute is very prescriptive. And the rules then would be virtually just a cut and paste of, of statute, and then that becomes the rules under which the agency oversees uh, the work of, of the independent schools and special funding, special funding. So uh, <coughs> it is true that virtually all of the work is simply updating or realigning existing rules. Uh, and our preamble, as the chairman has said, um, uh, seeks to fence the board in so that all of its changes to existing rules are directed by statute. You don't so, just get so, to go do that because it feels good. So if you did have some, the board decided that something about the career technical education rules they thought should be changed, under your kind of proposal, would they have the authority just to make those changes or to propose those changes to the rule? Or are you only under with legislative? Not if they're at all inconsistent with legislative direction. That's a good example of the board not having a technical background. And so the rules on technical education are largely driven by federal regulation. So you, you don't make changes at the state level to the rules on technical education without understanding the Carl Perkins Act. And those are highly contingent on federal regulation. Mm -hmm. So that's, you know, the board might desire to do some things, but they're going to quickly find themselves needing agency expertise. And the agency can't delegate its expert its, its responsibility to implementing that very important federal program to a board. And that might be a good example of the second category where maybe it should be in this bill that the agency promulgates those rules, a draft of those rules, and the board has to sign right. off because they're not getting into the nuts and bolts, but they're looking at the overall vision of the rules. Yeah, I mean, very, just on a very specific issue, we have you know, this issue uh, under the federal law, we're, we're required to, you know, Perkins law was reauthorized, so we're re required to do a new statewide plan. So the federal government looks at our statutory framework to sort of understand how we're going about doing that. And it's not clear to them either how we're supposed to go about doing that. So what we've done is we've shared with the board a couple presentations on the goals of our Perkins plan, and the board voted to affirm those goals. And then we've been embarking on a, a series of community engagement hearings that have been publicly advertised and so forth. That feedback's been put together with tech directors. Now that's coming in for a finalization. It's not clear due to our incoherence in our process as to who 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 is adopting this plan or you know. So yeah. we're gonna we're gonna talk with the state board at some point. You, is this something you see yourselves doing or is this something that governor signs? In some states it could be all above or nothing. You know, it's like we have to get more clear about what that process is. But if we had had to take that process, as I think would be anticipated here, through a state board process simultaneously with them doing Act 173 rules, there's no way we wouldn't be able to do it. And, yep. and it would be, we wouldn't have been able to do it either, technically, from the agency standpoint, because we're, we're supporting multiple public processes at the same time. It becomes very complex. Yeah. So. No, I, I, think, uh, I think you make some great points about um, the sort of ad hoc quality of this list. Um, you mentioned that that um, you'd be willing to undertake the journey, you called yeah. it, to, to look into each piece. That's really what we need you to do. Sure. I think the board is pretty clear. They've, um, John, correct me if I'm, wrong, if I'm wrong, but the board has signed off on this duties book call. 
In principle, yes, but not in particular. We have yet to have a meeting to go over the details of the committee. Okay. Um, but in principle, the idea is to is to transfer as many administrative functions as possible. Rules is one of them, but there are other things like I mentioned to you last time. We've been we are the people who have to uh, approve independent schools, but we do it relying entirely on what the agency has told us. And we have no expertise at that point. If we if we went out ourselves and looked at it, yeah, then we, but so that's a kind of administrative function that's residual to us, left over from pre-Act 98 days that needs to get cleaned up. So it's it's both those kind of administrative engagements that that we bring no value to. Uh, and the flip side of all that, by the way, is not to be doing less on the board, but to be freeing the board up to be getting above the granular and into the strategic. And a, a simple illustration of that is we convened a six to seven hour hearing last Tuesday in Rutland in which we took testimony from around 33 or 34 individual Vermonters, mostly educators, but the public also chimed in and gave us a, a different perspective. Um, and we're going to be sharing what we learned with you folks. And so that's a case where we come away with some insights about the sort of community slash political um, perspective that frankly is not what the agency is particularly good at or set up to do. Um, and so we think it's important that that, that kind of um, alertness and uh, pulse taking come to you and you decide, well, is there a statutory adjustment we need to make or not? Um, and so that we become part of that conversation with you and that uh, some pieces of that might need to take the form of rules. And that might be a case where we would have a stake in initiating rules, which in this case would be educational quality standards rules, to memorialize and uh, bring down to earth the statutory directive. So, it, I think if we are cut off from any ability to initiate rules, then that, that becomes our way of, of actualizing what we've learned and what we've shared with you. Mm -hmm. So long as we're fenced in that says you can't do it if they, you, don't tell us to. Mm -hmm. that's, uh, that's really crucial to me um, and to the board, I think. Uh, so, uh, preserving the ability to, of the board to take initiative in areas that that, that impinge upon the public, and that's what was the idea of most of these, um, uh, is, is, it seems to me that's the vital way that we can facilitate bringing change upon it. So, speaking of this, an another thing that you both should consider in, in this um, putting your heads together session, on page four of the draft, um, in laying out the duties and responsibilities of the board, it says review rules proposed by the Agency of Education prior to pre-filing the proposed rules um, with ICON. And so we asked if that was reciprocal. Um, in other words, if the agency was going to um, review rules that would be promulgated because it, I think I think later in Jim can track this down, but I think there's sort of reciprocal language. I don't think so. No, it's not reciprocal. No, it's a duty on the agency to provide you with the draft draft rules. No, but, and, but no, no it's certainly ought to be reciprocal. Yeah. And I think the, the page four is what I refer to sort of green light and red light opportunity. Yeah, it would be a good function that I would. I would observe that as much as you know, the board doesn't want to be penned in, it did a pretty nice job of penning us in. You know, and we have, um, you know, and this would be a point the committee would have to consider. I think it's it's very necessary that we operate in that sort of statutory understanding. But as an agency, we have the ability to create rules now absent that. And yep. so, as 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 does any department or agency yep. in state government. So. If we were going to anticipate some way to do that, we're going to have to create a special dispensation or directive to the agency on when and when it cannot make rules. This language makes it even more restrictive than we have now, and it really requires us only to do so in a very narrow definition of situation. Yeah. And I agree. Um, to back to uh, Senator Parent's question, if if we're imagining one of the roles of the board is to be a check on the agency, then it seems to me that. 
the agency should be a check on the board. Um, in, in you know our governance model, we tend to like checks and balances. So is, is there a way that we could make this reciprocal so that um, the legislature is confident that any rulemaking that comes out of either shop right. is, is viewed by the other? And I don't know about the, the mechanics of who's green lighting, what contingencies <laughs> we have, but, but you understand a more, a more equal distribution. We did stop when we looked at this and realized that what it did in effect was make a one-way uh, veto system, really. And it seems if there's going to be a, uh, a review prior to filing or even pre-filing, that, that that might be made reciprocal in order to get the most effect out of your working together. Um, so if I, if I could, um, it sounds like you thought you might be able to meet by the end of next week. We could maybe the following week have the two of you back. Well, we could. I was endeavoring to respond to a, an issue for us to draft something based on okay. criteria. I mean, I don't. I don't know. If, depending on how the logic plays out, I don't know where we'll come to agreement. On so, if I were even to take the logic of which I was starting to listen to the conversation, if I were to say. Um, the board at a policy or pol sort of that political dimension versus out of the administrative weeds, then the bulk of these I would take out of the board's list. Mm -hmm. you know, I mean, there, there would be very few things left on this list. Other, you know, maybe, maybe the, the first one. The first one, absolutely. The political ones, the state, the governance that requires interaction with the local authority, you know, anything with an appeal process, but any, any of those political ones, 33,000, 3,400. Those kinds of things, absolutely, state board. But everything else, to me, is a regulatory function or an administrative function that should be under the state board's or the agency's. Well, and, I, and I guess so what I mean, I'm, that's where the logic would lead me, absent other logic. I mean, I don't, I don't think we could negotiate. For your logic would lead me. Right. <laughs> and I'm, I'm open to, per, if you provide me other logic, well, I will change my logic. And I'm, I'm hoping to have that. John supply at least potential other right. logic. So what we could do is you guys could you guys, meaning the agency, could draft something, give it to us, John would look at it and say, I don't agree. Then sure. I'm going to ask the two of you to put your heads yep. together anyway. OK. So well, that's, that's easier for me. Yeah, I, can, I can produce a draft for John and the board to react. OK, so let's do that real soon, so that there's time for us to go back and forth. Well, forward. we've got other things to do. And this is you know, the, yeah. the issue of portraying this as delaying things all the time. But you know, I can stop doing something else to do this. I, we, we don't want to interrupt anything, and we're not. You know, I can do by next Friday, I think I can do. That's great. You know. That's great. And then when, when you feel that you've um, you put your heads together and you've, you've reached whatever meeting of the minds is to be had. Um, and then maybe bringing that and outlining the places where you disagree and why, that would be the material for our next. Do that, Paul. Can so, I just ask a so clarifying hard. question? Because I'm in listening to uh, the secretary. I think, what do you understand you're doing by next Friday? I'm yes, <laughs> I know you saw we, we kind of slipped. Yeah. I, uh, we're going to uh, endeavor to start with this and apply some of the logical sort from our perspective, and I'll share that with the chair of the state board and to you. Yeah. And uh, then you'll we'll convene some sort of get together on that, but we'll be reacting from a draft that the agency creates. Okay. And I will endeavor to do that by the end of next week. We'll try to get it done earlier so we can have more time to, to do the, get the heads together. Yep. Yeah. Metaphor. Um, yeah. Uh, is that so? Are you drafting a new list? Uh, yeah, that what that? I, I mean, what, what are you I'm drafting. Yeah, exactly. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> what are you drafting? A bill or a, 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 a reorganization of this yep. list? Of okay, list. so not you're not actually drafting a 113 page bill. I'm, abs I'm not reluctant to put our power on that until I and know what the framework okay. is you want to achieve. If you were to say, here's we, the logic we want. I, I think to be clear, yeah. yeah. To be clear, um, the state board put forward with, with our resources a draft. If the secretary wants to put forward a full draft, that should be your right. So don't feel constrained. Well, I know time being of the essence. That's yep. which, which yeah. I mean, if you if you'd like us to do that, I can go go just do that. Well, and then you can you know we can go through the regular process of sort of reconciling those pieces, which might be more efficient. I think before language is drafted, working with this duty split list is a is a real time saver, and I think the two of you meeting sooner rather than later. So 
as opposed to putting legal staff to drafting a long bill, what I meant was, I don't want you to feel that we're precluding you to the extent you want to draft language to okay. compete with what's already yeah. Yeah. Okay. I'm just thinking that, speaking just for myself personally, it's easier for, for me to work off a draft we already have and then change it based on what we all agree we want to change, right. rather than having 113 pages here, 113 pages here, and then going, Jim, what are, what's the differences? Can you put together a chart for us? And um, well, that would be. But the pages are mostly conforming changes. So. Yeah, I mean, the length, I, I just worry, you know, once again, the logic of it. And I, I also want to be, in, you know, there's stakeholders that are interested in this conversation that are by definition disenfranchised if we go offline and start negotiating. So I think the richness and the importance of this issue deserves full public scrutiny. And I, yeah. I would say the, the efficient way to do it would be to present a, a, an alternative draft of the rules, but just to say, you know, our my initial logic right now is to sort of separate this out based on policy versus or policy coherence and accountability. Um, I, the list that we have now, the lot that logic isn't clear, you know. So we're we're going to have di phenomenal, dif significant differences between what's here and what we would we would adopt. But the goal would be, and if you can take a finding statement, would be to promote greater coherence and accountability in the education mm -hmm. policy construct. And to, to situate the board in a, a place that allows it to do um, broader community engagement to interact on in those political dimensions of education policy. If I did that, I could walk through and do a draft. You know, but the starting point, because that logic is fundamentally different than what this is. If, uh, and, and I'm not retracting what I said about your being free to write whatever draft you want. Um, I will say if, if this is reminding me of the, uh, the school boards and the, and the NEA, um, I will say if the, if the logic is just that all rulemaking should stay with you and the board believes it has, um, because currently all of these things are now uh, in, in statute as the board's responsibility. So if the idea is that 100% of it goes to the agency, I, I think we found her immediately in trying to create a, right. a workable bill. So to the extent you can um, be flexible in that logical principle. Yep. Um, yeah, I, so it, much and I think that we're in a, I think general agreement again of this idea the board should be at a policy level. And that's that to me significantly yep. reduces the number of things. There's still yep. there will also be things on this list, but it'll be significant. Senator, uh, I'm sorry, Senator Ingram. Yeah, thank you. Um, so I was just trying to think of this sort of philosophically and, and think of an analogy in, in another um, agency in the state of Vermont uh, it, it, where there's any kind of similar relationship. And I know the Agency of, of uh, Human Services pretty well since I serve on that committee. And I'm thinking of like the relationship of that to the Green Mountain Care Board, yeah. for instance. Um, but I don't know. Can you help me think of another anal you know, an analogy of how you're thinking of your relationship to the State Board of Education? Yeah, I think it's you, know, you bring up AHS. That's an interesting. I'm, I'm immediately drawn to that dimension of the complexity as well <laughs> because there. I mean, look at pre-K policy, which is on the list. An added dimension here is we have a, a construct currently that requires regulation from two different agencies. Right. And we have a board that sits on our regulation, but they necessarily do not. So you know that's what you'll hear a lot from schools and private providers is this, this construct is overly complex. It's basically led to certain regulatory paralysis. But I think in terms of process, you know, the um, once again a theory, a part of the logic would be that the agency can be more responsive and held more accountable to a statutory intent than an independent board can be. Uh, if there was a, a policy and issue that was established in statute, let's say pre-K, and we were solely charged with doing it, you might see fit to create an advisory group to provide additional expert expertise and technical stakeholder work input into that formulation of those rules, or you might not. But you also could put some parameters, as you did with 173, specifically about what, how you want to see the rules formulated. So you can do that on a case-by-case -case basis. Um, but in terms of, uh, like, if, the, if I'm trying to draw the analogy of the Green Mountain excuse me, Green Mountain Care Board, if the agency had, um, the, or the board was situated at a higher policy level, which I think is 
commendable dimension because to get out in front of some of the education issues that we have today, we I think we need to be thinking farther out in the future. And I think the board might be in a better position to do that because your your roles are often caught up in this really you know, complex technical environment. If the board were to identify some issue, so for instance, one of the things we've identified through 173 reports is this literacy challenge we have as a state. Yeah. We found that through our surveillance, but ideally the board would have found that through their community engagement and looking at data and so forth. Mm -hmm. And they would then turn to us and say, in the form of a report and a recommendation, look, we, we have a literacy problem in the state. We want you to go forward and figure out you know, what a way to do that. And, and that would lead to a, a conversation with the General Assembly about a priority on literacy. <coughs> but I, so I could see them sort of functioning that level of identifying what's coming at us as a need based on looking at data or listening to communities about what needs are. The issue of equity, I think, is a, is a is growing issue, and the board could be very attentive in its fully pulpit function to go out on a regional basis and say, you know, these facilities look like this, and you know, these opportunities look like this. Here's what we found forcing us to kind of go into that equity sort of surveillance mode and re regulation policy to address it. Mm -hmm. And I, I have maybe intentionally and unintentionally disparaged the board's 2200 rules in this room. But I will say, um, Bill Mathis has nothing in his heart but the best intentions in terms of socioeconomic integration and equity. And so, you know, the, the board did, I think, err in getting out over its skis with that series of rules. But I had long talks with him about it, and it comes from his belief that the, that the state had a fundamentally inequitable system, and they were, they were trying their, their best to do that. Now, it happened in ways that exceeded their authority, I thought. But um, equity is definitely an area of where the board has been a, a, a leader in terms of communicating to the state. Um, well, gentlemen, thank you so much. Final well, question. I, I, well, maybe it's more of a comment. I just thought it might be helpful if we have the discussion that Senator Parent brought up about some of these things before they do a lot of this work. Because We'll do that next week. Because it seems like if even if all the rules were in AOE, but there was a red light, green light, or veto kind of process, since AOE's already doing them anyway, I don't see it as any difference, really. Mm -hmm. So we're actually, you, we have time tomorrow. We can have a committee discussion. Mm -hmm. Jeannie? Uh, yes. Could you block out like half an hour or 45 minutes tomorrow for a committee discussion about <coughs> This bill, but with no witnesses. Does that work? Um, we'll have to look at the schedule. Okay. We'll do it. That's the schedule. I can't imagine when we have a lot of testimony, we can't imagine bill takes that long. Yeah. yeah, no. Just at the end, after the testimony on 323. All right, we just got several more witnesses. Here. That's okay. Just put a half an hour um, for that committee discussion. That's a good idea. Gentlemen, thank you. Um, so we'll, we'll assume that um, your, your agency is beginning on the journey. We're going to take the lead on producing some, something. Beautiful. Okay. And, and then to the extent you can um, communicate with one another, that's great. And then we'll have the two of you back the week following um, on a mutually agreeable time. Good. Look forward to it. Thank you. Thank you. It's very helpful to have you both in the room at home. By the way, I didn't get to introduce earlier Peter Phelps and Jim Gleason from the State Board. Very nice to see both of you. Thank you. Yeah. Um, so, Jim, you want to join us? Uh, or were you heading out? Thank you. Uh, I was for, 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 for what? Well, you guys are going to have a few Yes, of course. That's the. Uh, the Hygiene products. Hygiene products. Oh, okay. And um, there's just a couple of general questions about Katie wasn't going to be able to answer. How did you get that all cleared up? Enforcement, for instance. Yeah. Yeah. Let's see what you're going to do. Basically. 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 Basically.
understand. Okay, so um, probably we don't have any questions for you. Okay. Thanks. Okay. okay, so committee, um, I wanted to just have a quick discussion about um, Senator Lyons' bill. Um, I've scheduled testimony. I went ahead and scheduled testimony for tomorrow from the usual suspects. So I was presuming um, interest in the bill. It seems to me an issue that we, as I pointed out, legislature is confronting in several different committee and policy areas. So finance has a bill to remove taxes on those products. Here, the, the intent is to um, compel districts that are not currently providing them to provide them. So general, general thoughts on that bill. Obviously, we don't have a fiscal note yet. We haven't talked to business managers or anybody else. But um, thoughts on it? I'm going to go meet with Tim on a transportation question. Quick. So uh, the, my, my question, maybe Senator Lyons talked about it. I, I wasn't sure what the problem was. Like, it sounds good. I'd be supportive of it. But I wasn't sure, like, is there a problem that we're solving, or are we just trying to provide a service? That's the only Let me ask a question. Is there, is there a problem? So um, speaking as a mother of two daughters, um, uh, often, and I think Senator Lyons did mention this a little bit, but um, girls who are first menstruating mm -hmm. um, don't always have their menstrual cycle on a specific schedule. Sure. It can be completely random to begin with. Right. And so they may not always be prepared. Um, okay. So having them available without having to go ask right. for them is really helpful. Sure, sure. There are also girls who may not have the ability, their families may not have the ability to afford them. They're actually quite expensive. Right. And so I think both from an equity of affordability and, and it is uniquely a female issue. Right. Um, uh, and so it puts girls at a disadvantage. It causes a lot of embarrassment. Right. Um, okay. you know, I was, that's what I, I wanted to make sure that's what it was. Yeah. It wasn't something else. Quick uh, yeah. testimony from Don Tinney. Right, Don Tinney, President of the Just to answer your question, we have discussed this with our board of directors. And across the entire board, the teachers have said that it is an issue yeah. um, for girls, and it and it's as young as fifth grade. Yeah. Um, and what we're finding, my counterpart in New Hampshire um, has they've done some surveys. They found that it leads to absenteeism because yeah. girls won't go to right. school, and and uh, in addition to the embarrassment. So yeah. it, it we we are not official. To, well, I guess it could be. We're 100 <laughs> percent in support yeah. of this. Um, <laughs> I think that's fine. I don't. Well, I, I, but, I would, but our board is very. You got Jeff Fannin coming. Yeah, in tomorrow. And, but it, but it's um, it, it. We have discussed it as a board, and, and we definitely would support this. Our, and and I think the other group you may want to hear from would be the school nurses. Yeah, I was, I was just going to suggest that. Yeah. I think that would be. I know we tend to hear from these four yeah. people all the time. Frankly, I find it a little annoying that it's always those four that weigh in on every bill we do. So I would really love to hear from the school well, nurses. They are the representatives of the bill. Know, the we also hear a school nurse association. association. I am pretty sure, there yes, there is a school, school nurses nurse association. Right. Yeah. Uh, I did some, a few phone calls that a lot of that's handled in the nurse's office right. if the student wants to go there to get the things that she needs, and that's a free of charge. Yeah. Senator Lyons was talking about the a lot of times they might not want to go. The shyness. Right. Yeah. 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 They, they go there for shots and pills and medication. Well, like the fiscal issue piece, I think it actually probably wouldn't have a ton of impact except for the installation of the machine right. or the dispenser. Right. You know what I mean? Because school districts are like they already probably purchased. They're already buying them. Right. So that was my point is that yeah. right. most of them are already buying them. It's just really the distribution mechanism. And I can, I can tell you personal experience if you have to go to the bathroom and then run to the nurse's office right. during that period yeah. when you're running to the nurse's office no pun intended yeah, yeah. you you can already you can bleed through your pants sure. and then that causes embarrassment especially for and a 13 year old absolutely. girl that's like the worst Correct. thing that could happen well Probably not the worst thing home. but that is a really embarrassing horrible thing that and yeah, the, the, the machines are i mean the not having them filled with it they're, they're not they're not fabulous either, so I, I no. don't know if we could come up with. I mean, I know in like high-end hotels and stuff, they'll just oh, have them sitting yeah. on a basket, but 
that, but then you had the vandalism problem. So it's a yeah. yeah. That's my my concern is just how how are we going to do this? It's different from what already happens with them. I'm sure person. I'm sure we'll hear testimony that. For instance, if there was a basket of them, that they would just wind up in the toilet. Yeah, um, it, yeah. Somebody you know, even in somebody's the, mad or they're, you know. Yeah, they become. In a mystery. Yeah, just assume that the only if you put it in the boys bed. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> that would only happen that they ended up in the toilet. No, no, no. No, so. unfortunately not. Boys are not the only ones who misbehave. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> Could you? Um, not my girl. Yes. I'm shocked. <laughs> there should be a Vermont. Um, I mean, it's a little nurse association. Sister, I learned from her dad that it's from her friends. Can you just um, look around on your computer a little bit? This is Don, do you happen to know? Is there, is there a... I have it maybe at the end. I know there I is can. There is a professional organization. This, this, okay. Because we, we have a sponsor there. We'll, we'll find who. I can make a call and find one. Yeah, great. <laughs>